Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Laura Huiza. I'm a staff attorney at the National Employment Law Project in our New York office. And I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar on exposing uh, wage theft without fear, uh, a discussion of retaliation and how to overcome it. Uh, before we get started with our discussion for today, I just wanna go over a few uh, technical issues and then I'll give you a sense of what we'll be discussing and the format. So first, uh, please note that if you're an attendee, uh, you're only going to be able to see the video feeds for speakers. So you won't see your own video. Uh, we've also muted all attendees throughout the webinar. Um, so you won't have that, that voice option. If you do have a technical issue at any point, uh, please use the chat button at the bottom of your Zoom screen and send any questions you have to panelists. Uh, our team is taking a look at those the whole time and they'll address them as soon as they can. If you would like to submit a question for panelists at any point during the webinar, you can also use that chat box to submit your question. And we're going to be collecting those questions and posing as many as we can to our speakers in the last uh, 15 minutes of today's webinar. This webinar is also being recorded. Uh, we will send an email as a follow-up with the recording as well as our speaker bios and any links to resources that we think you, you might find helpful. So as a bit of background for today's webinar and our goals for the, the discussion, as you might know, uh, NELP put out a report this summer back in June uh, looking at retaliation protection laws around the country, um, specifically focused on those for, that, for workers who are experiencing wage theft. We found uh, with this survey that most states not surprisingly, have very weak laws that don't offer what we would consider to be the very basics for an effective retaliation protection law, um, such as meaningful remedies and penalties and access to both courts and enforcement agencies. Our report showed that only five states and the District of Columbia had laws on the books for workers who experience retaliation in the wage theft context that we believe contain those most essential elements, um, although Minnesota and New Jersey have recently passed uh, amendments to their retaliation statutes that would also qualify them. On the other end of the spectrum, our report showed that six states have no retaliation protection laws at all for those workers, and in seven states, uh, they only have weak criminal prohibitions on retaliation. And then there were a lot of states in between. So what we learned through that analysis is obviously that there's a lot of work to be done just to make sure that every state at a minimum has strong retaliation protection laws for workers facing wage theft. Uh, we at NELP are working on some model retaliation bill language that we can share with you as uh, part of the follow-up to today's webinar. And you know, we hope that, we, uh, or that you keep us in mind for any work that you're doing around retaliation and labor standards uh, we're always interested in supporting uh, coalitions and campaigns and policymakers. Uh, but in putting our report together, we spoke with a lot of wage and hour attorneys and advocates around the country, and we heard repeatedly that even in places with relatively strong protections on the books, uh, retaliation continues to be a huge challenge, and the laws that are in place remain underutilized. So we've seen a lot of interest in figuring out what more we can do beyond putting new or better laws on the books in order to make retaliation protection a reality. And so we thought that we would try to contribute to the conversation that we know is already happening on this topic uh, through a webinar. And today we're, we're thrilled to have with us worker advocates who are experts on these issues from all across the country. And so through two facilitated conversations, we're going to aim to offer some insight into what workers and advocates are facing, how state laws often fail to protect workers, what has proven useful or not useful in this space, and where we might be able to go next. And ultimately, we know that there is no one answer to how to effectively deal with retaliation. 
but we know that there is a lot of interesting uh, work and exciting thinking and experimentation going on around the country that we can build from and engage a lot more with each other on. So without any further delay, I want to dive into our first conversation today. And this is a conversation that will focus on getting a sense from advocates in different parts of the country about uh, what they're seeing, um, how retaliation is impacting their organizing work and efforts to build worker power, as well as address wage theft, and how existing laws are sometimes limited, but how different strategies or tools um, have been promising, potentially, or not so promising. So we're going to be hearing in this conversation from Veronica Mendez Moore from the Centro de Trabajadores Unidos en la Lucha, or State Tool in Minneapolis. We're going to be hearing from Sofia Saman, who is with uh, the Raise the Floor Alliance in Chicago. We'll hear from Sarah Lieberstein from Make the Road New York. And we'll hear from Stephanie Garakanian from the Workers' Defense Project in Austin, Texas. So we've got a, a range of um, advocates from, from around the country. And I'd like to start us off with a question for everybody, all of our panelists. Um, you know, as we all know, retaliation is not a new issue. Uh, it's a persistent challenge to organizing and addressing wage theft and raising standards. So can you share with us a little bit about where in the country you're working, what kind of work you're focused on when it comes to wage theft, and how retaliation is affecting your work? Um, and if you can point us to any new trends that you're seeing and how employers are retaliating, um, that'd be great too, as a way to flag it for folks. So um, maybe we can start with uh, Veronica. Yeah, sure, thanks. Hi, can folks hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so my name is Veronica Mendez Moore. I'm the co-director of Sithul, and we are based in the Twin Cities, Minneapolis and St. Paul in Minnesota. Um, our work is uh, it's regional to, to the Twin Cities metro area. Um, so we have you know a few different areas that we're working in. We are specifically have a campaign moving in construction. Um, so talking to a lot of construction workers and a lot of uh, construction workers that are misclassified as independent contractors. Um, as well as uh, sort of we have like a general uh, wage theft clinic sort of thing that you know, folks from lots of different industries, hotel, restaurant, um, janitorial, and, and other low wage industries. Um, so some of the things that we're seeing, you know, I, I mean, I think are, are pretty typical employers, you know, scaring workers about hours getting cut, schedules getting changed, being fired, um, things like this. But, uh, but some of the stuff that we, we've been seeing in construction is has gotten uh, to, a, to a different, I don't know if this is a new trend or if we're just seeing it, honestly, um, but what, what we've been seeing is just a lot more threats of violence um, and actual violence happening in that industry where employers have a lot of control and it's either bordering on or actually trafficking. Um, and the kind of retaliation that happens there is much, obviously much more intense where it's about violence, where it's about uh, calling ICE and actually following through with it. I mean, we've heard a million threats to call ICE by employers that have never followed through, um, but now they are. And I think that that's a trend that we're seeing with the, with the administration is that that's actually, it's actually a real go-to thing that they can use against workers. Um, and as connected to that, I think like threatening workers' families, um, whether they're in the United States or whether they're in a home country, um, that is some of what we're we're seeing in that industry and threatening to like get people blacklisted out of the industry like this is a lot of what we're seeing in construction. Great. Thanks, Veronica. Um, Sophia, do you want to go next? Sure. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so, um, hi everyone, my name is Sophia Zaman and I'm the Executive Director of Raise the Floor Alliance. We're a coalition of eight worker centers based in, in the Chicagoland region. Um, and sort of the members of our, our alliance represent a wide swath of industries and geographies across, um, uh, across Illinois. And, you know, since our founding in 2014, retaliation was flagged, obviously, as the, the sort of most widely felt and deeply felt issue across our membership. Um, 
we actually we actually did a, a survey of our membership in 2015, um, and we produced a report called "The Challenging of Business: The Ch Challenging the Business of Fear," where we found that um, you know of of the folks we surveyed, half had um, experienced retaliation, and within the context of um, seeking uh, some kind of relief through a government or public process, more than 80% of our workers had experienced retaliation. Um, and again, this, this cut across all geographies um, in our network, all industries in our network. And so we, you know, the trends that we're seeing um, are consistent with what Veronica also shared. Um, we are certainly seeing in the, in the temp staffing industry, the use of um, blacklists or do not return lists when workers are speaking up around injuries in the workplace or a workplace violation. Um, and we, we know that, uh, that temp agencies are sort of evading accountability and, and sort of moving workers around based on you know how when when they when they do speak up they're put on these dnr lists um, and effectively being barred from work um, we're also seeing increasingly the use of no match letters and and um, immig use use of threats around immigration as a way to intimidate workers in active organizing campaigns um, so so yeah so very consistent with what veronica has shared great thanks sophia um, and Sarah, from your perspective in New York, yeah, can you can you share your thoughts? Sure. Um, just for a little bit of background, I, I work at Make the Road New York, um, which has offices in New York City, in Queens, in Brooklyn, as well as Long Island, Staten Island, and Westchester. And I'm in Make the Road New York's newest office in, in White Plains in Westchester County, which is just north of New York City. Um, and more suburban than the city offices. We organize and provide services in a, in a range of areas, um, and I work on the workplace justice team. Um, and what we're seeing, I think, is pretty consistent with what we've heard so far. I would say it, it, it does seem, uh, you know, as compared with what Veronica said, we might be in an earlier stage um, of employers' ability to fulfill or their threats to contact immigration authorities. We hear all the time from workers that employers threaten them with calling ICE. Um, I think a lot of the threats that we hear about are what I call pretaliation rather than retaliation, threats even before the worker has decided to take action. So many of the workplaces where my clients are, number one, we usually aren't seeing the clients until they've already left the job because they're so scared of coming forward. And this is partially because I think we don't yet have a workplace justice organizer in, in White Plains. So I don't know that we, we yet have the, the level of support and, and cohesion that we have in the New York City offices to support workers in coming forward earlier on. And though most of my clients have been hearing from their bosses for a long period of time, months, if not years, uh, threats to call ICE, to uh, jeopardize their housing, occasionally threats of violence themselves or their families back in their home countries. Um, and that's often done to prevent the workers from coming forward in the first place as opposed to punishment. But I, I will also say that very few of the threats are realized, um, but they happen against the backdrop of, of a high level of generalized fear. And that fear is, is rising as we see these really high profile examples of basically government assisted retaliation, which is what my coworker called it, um, the, the raids at the poultry plants. And there's also been a, a, a more recent example of a plaintiff in a wage and hour lawsuit who was detained in the middle of his deposition in upstate New York. And I don't know that our clients have necessarily heard of those, but they definitely put us on edge and have put our co-counsel when we co-counsel with private law firms um, on edge as well. Great. Thanks so much, Sarah. Um, Stephanie, can you share from your perspective? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Stephanie Garakani, and I'm with Workers Defense Project. I'm based in our Austin office, but we also have offices in, in Dallas and Houston as well. And we primarily um, organize uh, construction workers and their families. And uh, again, a lot of the trends that we're seeing with respect to retaliation um, are similar to what other panelists have shared already. Um, certainly hear about um, 
threats to contact law enforcement or to contact ICE, sometimes um, those threats do are realized specifically with respect to um, police being called to the scene. For instance, we've certainly heard many cases that involve a fact pattern like that. Um, termination, um, blacklisting, um, and then also have seen counterclaims, um, like frivolous counterclaims filed as well when, when um, workers that, that we're representing choose to take action. Great, thanks so much, Stephanie. Um, so going into some of the more specific questions that I think folks have been grappling with, uh, maybe we can start with um, Sarah in New York. Um, I know that Make the Road uh, has a large membership. Um, you mentioned you offer um, you know, legal services on wage theft mm -hmm. and also work on organizing campaigns. Um, could you tell us about some of the specific ways that Make the Road has addressed retaliation in the past and maybe share some thinking on what tools have been useful or inadequate? Sure. I mean, it, it seems like it's always easier for us and we have more tools at our disposal to address retaliation and to talk with workers in a helpful way about retaliation when the workers are already members or longstanding clients of the organization. And with the support of the Workplace Justice Committee, we can help better prepare the worker for what's to come. And in other cases, group cases, we've been able to get members who have been through an organizing campaign and a lawsuit or a DOL investigation to come and talk to newer clients who are in the point of filing. And I think that's, that's really helpful. Um, even when I am meeting with clients who are newer to the organization, um, I've found that I'm spending more time talking with them about the possibility of retaliation, always asking them what they expect their employer is going to do when we file. Um, and when they've heard specific threats, just to, to talk through with the worker whether or not they think that the employer is going to follow through. I think the benefit to employers threatening over a long period of time that they're going to call ICE is that when workers see that the employers haven't fulfilled those threats in, in the past, it does send a signal, although it, you know, maybe puts everyone on uh, in a state of anxiety, low level anxiety. The worker has seen also that this boss is always threatening to call ICE, always threatening to call his friends in the police department, and it's never happened. And so it, it does give us some room to talk through with the worker what, what they think is, is real and, and what's just meant to really intimidate them. Um, so I, I think we're really trying to just strike that balance when we talk with workers to prepare them for what's to come and not to overblow um, the risks because we haven't been seeing employers really following through um, all that frequently. Um, we do work closely with um, New York State Department of Labor's anti-retaliation unit um, and all of our attorneys are ready and prepared to call as soon as we hear an issue. Um, that the, the, the swift response, I think, makes a huge difference. Um, the, the longer the legal action, the more opportunity we're giving to employers to, to intimidate and to escalate their threats. So overall, I think the speed at which um, an agency can, can do, conduct its investigation or, or just respond and maybe call an employer in real time when they're making a threat is, is really critical to, the, to our partnership with enforcement agencies. And um, I, I think in, in some cases, there's also a little bit of employer education that may be helpful, especially, um, I think as Stephanie said, um, that you're, they're seeing counter suits, which we, we're seeing a lot in construction as well. And making sure that the employer knows that that's a legal retaliation, I've actually like sent the provision of the New York labor law to them and <laughs> explaining why um, they're violating the law can be helpful and if not uh, addressing it right away. Great. Thanks, Sarah. And we will be hearing from someone from the New York Department of Labor and about their anti-retaliation unit later in the webinar. Um, and I guess building on that, uh, Veronica, I know that State Tool, you know, works a lot on wage theft, also organizing campaigns. Um, you've had a lot of um, recent important legislative victories in the Twin Cities, too, getting a $15 minimum wage and wage theft legislation. 
So I guess, can you share your thoughts um, on what has been useful or not so useful in addressing retaliation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, you know, in previous contexts, like, like pre new laws that we've passed, you know, legal tools have been just wildly insufficient and we've used a lot of public pressure and political pressure um, to combat retaliation, both on the front end and in terms of inoculation of like, you know, here's a, or if we're going after a specific, you know, if we have a specific campaign, like sending a letter to that employer on the front end of an action that signed by 20 state legislators that says you can't retaliate against people. Um, you know, proactively and then after the fact. But since we've we've passed some of the new laws that are they're just now coming into effect, but some of the tools that we've won are um, we won on a city level rebuttable presumption around retaliation. So if a worker files a complaint um, or actually even just complains to their boss with uh, about having their rights violated or their wages stolen, then they, if the employer takes any adverse action against the worker, within 90 days of that, then automatically the employer is assumed to have retaliated unless they can prove otherwise. So that's something we just won um, and are looking forward to an opportunity to, to the opportunity to use this because I feel like even retaliation protections that, it, that are, are in existing law, like they just don't get taken seriously. Like departments just don't take them seriously ever and so like I'm hoping that like honestly I don't think this provides that much more protection but my hope is that we can use it as a as a hook to get into the actual investigators and be like this is really serious and um, now you have to make the employer prove it so give that like make them for real prove it then uh, so that's kind of what I'm hopeful about with that um, and we'll see we'll kind of see where that goes um, but like some of the the, one of the challenges too that we're also trying to get around is that, you know, we have like oftentimes the workers that are members of our organization that get retaliated against for speaking up about their rights are also being retaliated against because they're organizing, right? They're just like organizing generally for things that are above and beyond the law. And so when they go and they talk to an investigator at the Department of Labor and say, well, my boss is retaliating against me because I, you know, asked for my stolen wages and because they didn't like I was passing around a petition about improving, um, you know, Im improving our break room. Then the investigator goes, oh, well, that's not retaliation for something that I can enforce. That's NLRB stuff. And then it just disappears. And so that's a huge problem that I don't quite know how we're going to work on at a state level or a city level. Um, but it's something we're thinking about. Mm -hmm. No, thanks so much, Veronica. And I'm curious, um, maybe going on to uh, Stephanie in Texas, where I think the environment is obviously very different from that in uh, New York and uh, Min Minneapolis. Um, Stephanie, I guess are there uh, things that have or haven't worked for you all, um, or are there particular obstacles that you're grappling with in your organization? So um, I think um, one big obstacle is that we actually don't have a state law on the books that um, provides for um, protections against retaliation when someone pursues a, a state wage claim. And so we don't really have um, the sort of legal infrastructure that I think exists in other places, even though I know the fact that sometimes the law might be on the books in other places doesn't mean that it's being enforced um, to the extent to which many of us would like. Um, in terms of what we've tried to do, I mean, certainly um, we've tried, you know, where, where we can, we've pursued, you know, a Section 7 violation through the NLRB. Um, we have a, um, a criminal statute which does um, criminalize certain forms of, of wage theft. Um, if there's the ability to show intent not to pay, I think um, as our analysis about the intersection of um, the criminal justice and immigration enforcement systems has evolved over the last 10 to 15 years. I do think that we try to be a little bit more cautious when we choose to pursue criminal remedies to um, address wage theft violations, but I do think that there are instances in which we've attempted, sometimes successfully, sometimes not, to show that retaliation does evidence intent not to pay under those statutes. Um, I, I also feel like what's what has been most effective, assuming that we're able to respond in this way, has oftentimes been more of an organizing-centered response than a legal response. Um, 
where we've tried to do a rapid response action at the work site if we can, but of course um, it's not always easy to, um, to organize something like that at the last minute. And I think those typically tend to be more effective if the retaliation happens closer in time to when the workers affected actually were on the work site. Um, but certainly that's a tool that we've used in the past um, as well. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, and Sarah, from your perspective in Chicago, um, I guess are there other obstacles there that you're seeing or a need for other kinds of reform? Oh, Sophie, I think you might be on mute. There, I think that, Sophia? We can hear you, Sophia. Um, well, maybe well, um, while we get Sophia set up, maybe Kim, you can um, help uh, chat with Sophia to make sure her audio is working. Um, maybe uh, m moving on into, um, sort of, I guess, looking forward, um, where can we go in terms of coordination um, or working together more across the country on this issue? Um, perhaps, I don't know, Sarah, if you could share your perspective and then others, you know, please jump in on, on that question. Or Ver yeah, Sarah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so just kind of like where where is there room to coordinate with yeah. that? Yeah. I mean, even, even within Make the Road, I think we've seen the need for better coordination among our immigration team and the workplace justice team and holes in the employment law attorneys understanding and our organizers understanding of what legal protections our workers have, um, you know, beyond the retaliation protections and when they're most at risk so we can give the most nuanced advice possible. And I, I think overall um, that seeing materials and pointers and, and sessions, know your right sessions by immigration law attorneys, but directed to workers on their rights in the workplace and also the materials that NELP and NILP worked on that were addressed towards employers about their responsibilities under immigration laws are really, really helpful because I, I think that we as employment attorneys, um, especially working with organizers, have ideas for how to talk to workers about some of these issues, in, especially in the, in the course of an organizing campaign. We know how to, what the retaliation statutes uh, that we might invoke say and how to make out a claim, but we don't always, we're not always like best positioned to really help a worker to evaluate the, the threats and their vulnerabilities and to understand how to best respond. So I, I, I think that type of coordination between um, immigration lawyers and activists and worker organizers and, and lawyers is really, really helpful and gives us some really specific tools and some really good technical advice that helps us to have better conversations, more effective conversations with workers. Um, and then I think just broadly, the, the more that we can support each other um, with really good collective action and organizing and, and, and the more support we have overall, organizing we support we have for cases, the better. And I think it's, it's, it's just a, a whole overall. Um, but the the more the better positioned we are to respond, not not just to respond to employers who are retaliating retaliating against workers, but to have a big organizing and public presence for bigger cases overall, puts employers on notice that there are going to be real repercussions for the retaliatory acts um, that will include not just another legal claim that may or may not be enforced down the road, but potentially a public outcry or a threat to the the viability of their business. And that's so much more effective really than anything that's in the statute. Thanks. Yeah, I don't know, I see Veronica nodding and others. I don't know if you have thoughts on that. Yeah, totally. I mean, that's been the, by far the most effective thing for us with retaliation is both on the front end inoculation and on the back end, like inoculation that there's gonna be a whole shit storm with public pressure and politicians and everything and actions in front of your place. 
and on the back end actually doing that. So like that's been the best way that we've been able to prevent retaliation and like get workers or jobs back if they're retaliated against um, and things like that. So the thing I think about in, in terms of um, how we collaborate on this is like, I think that precedent setting is really important and how do we actually think about the precedent that each other, like how do we communicate about Sunday like it actually makes a big difference when I go to the city of Minneapolis and I'm like well in Seattle this happened and they interpreted this like this and they're like oh huh that's interesting so I think that matters and like the only way that any of this any of the legal protections or anything amount to anything is if we can actually change the the culture around the fear of retaliation which is like keeping workers from being scared on the front end um and knowing that they're going to be backed up. So I, I just, I think we have to do more to like publicize, um, you know, not just via media, but just like in talking to workers and in sharing with each other, like what are the precedents that we're setting? That's the, the thing I'm excited about using the rebuttable presumption to do is set that kind of, is set that kind of precedent. The, precedent. Um, the other thing is I think collaborating across, not just organizations like ours who are doing the same kind of stuff um, about what, what's working but also coordinating and, and i think sarah just said this with like different organizations that are that can come in at a different part of the work like whether it's immigration and um and the workers rights pieces uh different kinds of lawyers different kinds of community community organizations um i also i saw a question somebody wrote in the chat here that i think is really important about um talking to ice like do we like when an employer is intentionally calling ICE to come in, um, do, has anybody called ICE to like try to enforce the MOU that ICE shouldn't be coming in when there's a labor dispute? And we actually, we have done that. We've actually done that a bunch of times. And we didn't do it ourselves because we don't trust ICE and like it just freaks me out to call ICE from my phone or email them from my computer. Um, but, how, but how are we collaborating with community partners that can? Like who are the legislators that we know that have have a relationship with ICE because they're like elected officials and have to and how can we use them to to get that message across and we've actually been able to stop we've been able to slow down I-9 audits um, and have been able to as a community not just us but like actually push push back on them and win um, when employers were doing that on purpose by like having people communicate with ICE and then having us have a big public pressure campaign mounted Thanks, Veronica. Um, so helpful. Uh, I don't know, um, Sophia or, or Stephanie, if you would have thoughts as well. I think let's see if uh, so. Let's see if we can get Sophia. Her, if we can get her mic going. Sophia, are you unmuted? Um, we'll let her jump in. Oh, here we go. Is that her, Sophia? No. no, it's Kim. I've been trying to chat her to, uh, okay. she's, she's got her, uh, got it on mute. So we're working through it. Okay, thanks. So maybe Stephanie, I don't know if you have any thoughts in response to, to those. Comments. Sure. I mean, I think I am, um, I think I definitely be curious to know how other folks have used organizing strategies um, to respond to retaliation in other places. Um, I, I, I feel like um, there's a lot of room for creativity. Um, when when we think about using utilizing those strategies and I would certainly benefit from knowing how other people are using them. I also think that um, collaborating with people out, outside of the even kind of the, the workers rights immigrant justice space but for instance um, we've talked in the past with people who do housing justice um, who also are dealing with tenants who have experienced retaliation as a way to just share ideas and I think that those conversations have been really helpful. I um, and maybe this will come up later on in our conversation, but I'm also, I think just like the challenge of how to prove retaliation is always something too that I'd be curious to hear more about. Um, certainly, um, it's similar to some of the discrimination claims that we see, but um, certainly a, a lot of the forms of retaliation that we, that we hear about seem to be veiled threats, like sometimes there are employers that put things in a text message very blatantly, but oftentimes um, there are other um, actions that feel retaliatory to me that are certainly less um, black and white and I'd be really curious um, to hear what evidence um, other folks are, are citing to try to, to prove retaliation in other places. Yeah, thanks Stephanie. I don't know, Sarah, um, Sarah Veronica, if you have thoughts on any of those questions, sort of 
what kind of organizing is really helpful? How can we be more creative? And, and how do we prove retaliation when it's so hard? Do you want to go ahead? Um, sure. Uh, um, on, on proving retaliation, I think it is really challenging, especially when the employer is able to just use code words to allude to consequences that the worker is already really aware of. Um, so I don't know that I, I have a really ans easy answer to it, but I'm, uh, I'm, I'm curious to hear what other people are thinking. I mean, ditto on the texts. We, we talk a lot with workers about how important it is to, obviously, I think everyone's doing this, to maintain whatever form of proof of anything that's going on on the job um, in the form of texts or, or, or saving voice recordings. And it's been super helpful. And in some cases, it's, you know, we have the threats right there. Sometimes employers, it's the, the attorneys, I mean, the employer's attorneys who are making the, the threat of the countersuit in a response to demand letter. So that's helpful in some ways, although it, it still scary and something that we have to grapple with. Um, we have one case where the worker's husband had saved on her old phone threatening voicemail messages um, and was able to dig it up. So a lot of times too, we're asking workers to, to dig up old phone recordings um, and, and just use whatever possible. But I also think, you know, the, the, the definitions of retaliation that are possible to get in the, the statute, the more helpful it is also to proving the claims if we have to do it. So um, statutes that define retaliation broadly to, to extend beyond threats made to a current employee at work but also extend to communications to worker once they've left empl employment, that not just to include um, you know, threats of, of material harm, whether that's financial or physical, but you know, that can be vague threats of, of future action. Um, and I think there's a particularly good example I just saw in the New York City human rights law in discrimination cases. Um, you know, gives us a lot more room to show why the the vague threat um, or the threat that took place months after, but still carried a lot of weight for the worker who may be living in the same community as some of her um, coworkers or former employer is still retaliation, and it's it's actionable. Um, so I don't I don't think that there's an easy answer, but definitely talking with workers a lot about trying to making an effort to memorialize whatever threats they're hearing in a recording or in text, even if it's by asking questions to sort of to, you know, of the boss to, to get it down in text and saving it, saving everything as, as well as really trying to get the broadest language possible in the statute or in the agency's interpretation and regulations and guidance definitely helps us to prove the retaliation when it looks more like a lot of what we're seeing, which is is not like a very um, explicit direct threat all the time. Yeah. No, thank you, Sarah. And I, I will say that the model retaliation bill that NELP is working on is trying to take into account some of the difficulties that we're seeing in proving retaliation. And um, we really are trying to put something out there that will be a lot more responsive to what we're seeing on the ground and what courts have been reluctant to to believe, basically. Um, and we have maybe one minute left for this um, first conversation before moving on to our second group of panelists. And I think Sophia is back. Um, so maybe if, if, you, if you all just have any final thoughts or questions even that you would pose for our attendees about you know, what you think we should be exploring or doing um, or, or anything that you would put out as kind of a final thought. Um, Maybe we'll start with uh, Sophia, if you can. Here's, I think you're back. Maybe not. <laughs> Sorry. Um, maybe Stephanie, Veronica, or Sarah, if you have any kind of parting thoughts. I'll just say one thing that we've tried, and, and I don't know yet if it's going to be successful or not, but we did recently 
um, pass um, paid sick time ordinances in, in different cities in Texas that do include an anti-retaliation provision. Um, some of those ordinances haven't gone into effect yet, but I, I am interesting, interested to see if we can do concurrent like paid sick and um, more traditional wage theft claims and just take advantage of the paid sick anti-retaliation provisions um, in some of those um, in some of those cases. So it's something that we will try, um, but uh, success yet to be determined. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Stephanie. Yeah, Veronica or Sarah? Yeah, so I, you know, I continue to think and this conversation is just kind of ingraining it more deeply in my guts that um, like the NLRB, at the NLRB, we've won way more retaliation stuff than we have at the Department of Labor. And it's not because the law is stronger. It's because they're looking for it all the time. Because that's like the main thing people go there about. And so I just, I think there's a huge level of education and relationship building that we need to have with our departments. Like, can we have like convenings where we're like really getting deep in the dirt with them about all the shit that happens. Like that feels really important to me. And I think that there's some important public work to do in highlighting how much of a problem this is. But it also makes me really nervous to be like, Hey, everybody, retaliation is a huge problem as our public message. Like, that doesn't seem very inspiring to workers. So my gut and, like, how I think we've think, thought about it is, like, how do we on the inside have that conversation with, um, with investigators about the problem and then externally publicizing as much as possible the, reta the swift retaliation victories mm -hmm. we have when we organize and, like, fight back with public pressure. Great. That's so helpful. And I do want to make sure that we leave time for the second panel. So maybe um, we'll actually end there. And there will be time for sort of last comments and, and questions at the end. Is that OK? Uh, great. Thank you so much to our first uh, panel of speakers. And I'm going to pass it on to Sarah uh, Cullinane at Make the Road, uh, New Jersey. And she'll be facilitating our, our second conversation. Thank you, Sarah. Oh, Sarah, we can't hear you. Maybe you're on mute on your computer or your phone. Oh, no. Um, uh oh. Let's give her just a second. Um, Kim, is, is uh, Sarah muted? Nope. No, she's not muted. Okay, Sarah, maybe if you can call back in, or I can do the intros and get us started while you fix that. Just jump in when you're ready. Um, so with our Does second, work? oh yeah, there we go. Welcome, awesome. Your name? <laughs> yes, perfect. Thank you. Okay, I'm sorry about that. I switched from phone to computer. Um, so thank you so much for the opportunity um, to join you all and to listen on this incredible conversation. Uh, my name is Sarah Cullen, and I'm the director of Make the Road New Jersey. We're a grassroots immigrant and workers um, rights organization, um, and this conversation is going to be sort of the uh, sort of another perspective on retaliation and um, and how what we can do as advocates once we win a strong retaliation law, we have it on the books, how we can approach implementation um, and um, think about some really good or emerging practices from the state enforcement agencies and workers groups um, and how we can collaborate between agencies and work organizations. Um, so I'm really excited to welcome Winnie Chow from uh, who's a litigation and senior staff attorney the Workers' Rights Program of the Asian Americans Advancing Justice Asian Law Caucus, uh, and Jim Rogers, who's the Deputy Commissioner for Worker Protection at New York State Department of Labor. Um, and I'll just say personally, and from the perspective of Make the Road New Jersey, we just passed a um, big uh, landmark anti-wage theft bill with the help of many of you on this call, um, including NELP. Um, and I'm really excited to dig in and learn about, you know, now that we have some strong anti-retaliation um, language on the books, how can we work to really the enforcement piece is working. Um, so I'm actually going to start my first, my first question is for Jim, and I wanted to open up a question for you, um, you know, from the agency perspective, from the enforcement perspective, what is really working um, and what isn't working in terms of retaliation? What are the best ways that you're finding to hold employers accountable? We know that New York has incredibly strong laws on the books. Um, and, and how are you able to enforce them? And I think you know, if you, answering that question, but also um, if you want to speak to some of the concerns about ICE and immigration um, that have come up from the advocates, um, it'd be great to hear 
how uh, New York is responding. Yep. Okay. Um, thanks a lot. Um, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Um, so I think our statute is reasonably uh, strong compared to um, other places, maybe. But um, despite that, it was really the implementation of a process to actually make the statute worthwhile. Um, that was our biggest uh, challenge. So in 2015, we started the anti-retaliation unit, which is um, we pair uh, investigative attorneys, two of them, um, with experienced um, labor standards investigators um, and to, you know, in the implementation of labor law section 215. And, and the reason we did that is there's endless reasons. Um, the first two major reasons is that, um, you know, obviously when it comes to retaliation, um, timeliness is critical. You know, there's no sense in like applying some kind of remedy, um, you know, far down the road during an investigation or, or something else. And so we needed a sort of standalone unit that would just deal with the retaliation. So we sort of decouple a wage claim and the retaliation part and the retaliation unit job is to sort of move quickly um, on the retaliation piece as the wage issues get investigated. And um, because when they were all sort of one piece, it was, it was difficult to have that nibble, nimbleness that we needed. The second part was to sort of bring investigative attorneys into uh, the mix. Um, the labor law in New York State gives the department um, subpoena power, both for uh, documents as well as testimony. So um, bringing employers in and swearing them in in sort of, it's not so much a deposition as a, a law enforcement type of inquiry or hearing, um, that is a, a powerful tool. Also having attorneys alongside investigators um, uh, confront employers uh, quickly after the retaliation happened, um, we found that um, to be uh, effective. So the timeliness thing, uh, being able to bring um, experienced litigators uh, to bear sort of bringing um, the sense of the Department of Labor as a as a law enforcement body um, you know, to the forefront um, is is really important and um, so in that way um, that's sort of where to the extent we are succeeding at this that's why um, so, you know, uh, but of course the challenge is, um, is scale, you know, you know, how to stay on top of this. Um, and, I, you know, I, I could speak to the immigration issues as I see them if you want. Um, you know, it's our number one concern. It's our number one triage complaint. It gets the highest, um, you know, it gets, our, it, it, it gets triage as sort of a level one case. It, it gets our immediate attention and our immediate action um, because of all the reasons that you say, because it's, it's not just threats. Sorry. It's not just threats. It's, you know, people are making good on those threats. Hang on. Someone's calling me in. Uh, I, I, sorry about that. My office phone. So, uh, you know, people do make good on those threats. Uh, you know, ICE definitely does get called. Um, the whole I-9 process you know, that happens, that's retaliation. If you mention I-9, you know, after a, a worker's made a complaint or you seek out additional documents, that's retaliation. We need to stop those processes, um, you know, right away where we can. Um, um, if building service workers are threatened with eviction, so we actually get involved in preventing evictions. I mean, we'll go to housing court and let the judge know this is part of a retaliatory scheme that we're investigating. So you need to adjourn this eviction case so that the, the, the employee can stay in their place. Or um, another example of where, you know, we have to act fast is employers, you know, um, not only bring retaliatory civil suits, they allege crimes. Uh, and when they do that, we try to interface with local law enforcement. We, you know, we put in an immediate call to 
whoever the, the, the local is, county sheriff, county police, NYPD, whoever it may be, as well as district attorney on that case to let them know that what the context is. And that can perhaps forestall an arrest. Um, and that's happened. We've been able to prevent arrests on sort of these uh, fake retaliatory allegations or in the event there is an arrest, um, sort of avoid cash bail being set um, so that somebody can be released um, on their own recognizance and we've been able to do that. So, um, and then obviously um, we depose people, we take their sworn testimony, we subpoena their documents, we do a deep dive and in investigation and then we impose penalties as well as liquidated damages up to $30,000 combined, um, depending upon the level of the case. So those were all the successes, you know, and I can tell you about what's not working also. And I guess just you've described a really wide range of tools that you have at your disposal and you're, you know, taking really um, creative action and really meeting the workers where they are to, to face retaliation and fight retaliation where, wherever it comes up. I guess, do you see this it hasn't actually been deterring employers from retaliating against employees um, when they file complaints or when they, you know, ask for their wages? And what do you think it would take to, you know, get to, to really deter employers in the first instance? So it's always hard to like measure deterrence because the volume of retaliation has gone up, you know, so much and we can't know sort of quantitatively whether we're, we're, we're deterring anybody. And conversely, um, just because the number of retaliatory acts is taking place, it doesn't mean our complaints are going up. You know, that could actually be the reason sometimes complaints go down. Um, so that's another hard thing to measure. In general though, um, sort of hitting individual employers as hard as we can on a retaliatory act um, um, and publicizing that we've done that we hope has a deterrent effect. I just don't think we do. I really don't think that we have a deterrent effect. And as, as, as a former uh, public defender, where I spent the majority of my life, I have to say that, you know, in this area, and I know we're, everyone's debating about the value of criminal, the criminal law in the space of workplace justice, but when it comes to retaliation, which is precisely like whip witness tampering and precisely like obstruction of justice, um, um, I'm not sure that employers are going to get the message, especially the kind of bottom feeding employers that make immigration threats or make good on immigration threats. You know, I just don't think they get the message with fines and liquidated damages and sort of litigating with the regulator and, and all these other things. I only think they're going to get the message if they're treated the same as anybody who's sort of obstructing, um, the administration of justice. Um, on on a workplace justice in investigation, I, I don't I don't see you know huge organizing campaigns can work, but are they scalable? Um, um, all the work that we're doing in our anti retaliation unit, you know, works, but is it scalable? Um, I think that someone who uh, threatens somebody to that extent such that they're depriving them of their livelihood, uh, they're depriving them of their right to speak, they're extorting them, and they're bumping up against labor trafficking because the extortion is to have them keep working and shut up at the same time. I mean, if you compare that to other crimes which are prosecuted all the time, um, you're really saying if we don't prosecute this as a crime, we're sort of disenfranchising a, an entire class of victims simply because they're workers and they're, they haven't been victimized in some other context. And so that's what I'm thinking. Um, <laughs> oh, thank you, Jim. And I wanna, um, I wanna now turn to California. Um, Winnie is joining us and has done some really innovative work, um, collaborative work between state enforcement agencies and worker organizations. Um, to really address retaliation issues head on. Um, and I wonder if you can share some of the lessons um, you've learned in California and, and reflections on your work there. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for having me as part of this great discussion. Um, I guess maybe just a little bit of background on Asian Law Caucus for those who aren't familiar, just to give a little bit of context for where our 
where my remarks are coming from. Um, most of the workers that we represent in our clinic or through our clinic are monolingual, limited English proficient, uh, low income workers. A lot of them are restaurant workers, um, caregiver workers. Um, and, you know, like everyone, I think really we've struggled over the years of how do we do this direct service work more strategically because we could file individual wage claims until the end of time. But what we have been doing in the last couple of years is really working more collaboratively with the state labor commissioner's office affirmative investigative arm. It's called the Bureau of Field Enforcement or BOFI. Um, and we have found that working with them, with worker centers um, to build a bigger case with a on the ground organizing campaign and a comms component has been a way that we can have broader impact and um, reach more workers. Um, and kind of influence the industries a little bit more. But um, basically the, the BOFI process has worked really well on the retaliation front um, too, because um, I think so many of our low wage immigrant workers, there is really no option of litigating any of these retaliation claims in court. A lot of them have language barriers. They can't find a private attorney. We can't get a private attorney to take the case because of the um, amount of damages at issue or questions of collectability. And so really the labor commissioner's process is the only viable option for them for retaliation claims, even with these great laws on the books. And what we've found is that um, we've worked with Bofi a lot in how to prioritize and address these retaliation claims that come up in these Bofi cases, these collaborative cases together to fast track those cases and handle them more quickly. Everybody's recognized that speed is, is of the essence, the chilling effect that it can have on a campaign and on a workplace investigation. Um, and um, so with, with kind of the recognition from our you know, the great labor commissioners we've had in Julie Sue and our current um, labor commissioner who also comes from community, Lilia Garcia. Um, a fast track program has been created where retaliation claims that come out of a BOFI collaboration case with the community um, are um, processed much more quickly are supposed to be processed more quickly. So complaints are to be reviewed within 24 hours and assigned to a deputy um, that um, it, the complainants are to be um, interviewed within days uh, and talked to, and then a notice to be sent out to the employer um, um, within a set amount of time with a response demanded. And if a response isn't um, provided, that a determination is issued. If a response is provided, then um, making a decision, ideally within 30 to 90 days. So that has made a big difference, I think, um, with those collaboration cases. Um, we do find that more and more workers um, that we represent are interested in the option of doing a wage theft enforcement case with BOFI because it's a way to get class-wide relief without having to conduct class litigation. It's a way around mandatory arbitration agreements. And with the state, bringing the case in the name of the state, um, the workers have that shield. Um, and it's Bofi versus the employer instead of Mr. Lee or Mr. Fang versus the employer. And so workers feel more protected from retaliation in that way. And when it does happen, if it does happen, um, that the state is behind them um, or invested um, in, a, in a way that's not true um, in, in a typical case. Thank you. Um, and can you speak to some of the challenges in, in this type of collaboration and in the BOFI process um, as you rolled it out? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, a lot of the challenges are what <laughs> folks have already been talking about during this webinar. Um, I think that even with the fast track process, um, it still takes a long time. And so, you know, it's cold comfort for a worker to, to know that they have a retaliation claim or a case um, when they can't put, put food on the table. Um, so even though the fast track process is faster, it still takes a long time, um, still takes six to eight months in the most recent case that we had. Um, so um, I think the other challenge is that it still requires the worker to come forward, a worker to actually come forward and file the 
retaliation claim to get the whole process started. And folks are still really scared to do that. Um, and just the problems of proof um, that everybody has mentioned. So some ideas that folks have um, developed to address some of these challenges is um, pushing agencies to be a little bit more open to doing something short of making a de determination on the merits. So even if there is a problem of proof or it's he said, she said, um, it makes a huge difference um, to the workers. Um, and I think to the situation, it, if even the agency can make a call and say, we got this claim, we're concerned about it, this is really troubling, and that's, you know, we're watching carefully, that, that makes a difference. Um, it um, helps the preemptive warnings that folks have talked about. We do that too, um, to have the state deputy call and say, um, remind the employer about the anti-retaliation protections and what's against the law in terms of threats made to workers. Um, um, and I think um, 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 you know, there's legislative, there's a legislative fix that um, worker advocates have pushed through. Um, it was a exciting bill, um, SB 306, actually. It's a bill that amended the law so that both you can actually go in on their own without a sign complainant to do an investigation and cite for retaliation. Um, and that has changed the um, procedural posture of these retaliation cases. A lot of times we file these retaliation cases with the labor commissioner and even determine determination from the labor commissioner's office. Um, if the employer doesn't comply, um, the, the labor commissioner has to actually go file a civil suit in court in order to get any relief. Where And in that civil suit, they have to prove the discrimination all over again. So um, the citation process, though, would allow um, the BOFI to cite for the retaliation that it's a, that's occurred, and then it's on the employer to appeal the citation. And there's an administrative hearing about um, whether the citation is valid, and then the employer has to post an actual bond to appeal it to civil court. So it changes the procedural posture in a way that's, I think, much more conducive to getting more immediate or a more timely relief. So um, those are just some of the um, changes in the works that bill um, is that th that law, we haven't seen it um, actually um, still working on the implementation and, and, and applying it to an actual case, but it's an uh, um, exciting um, new tool. Thank you so much, Wendy, and please keep us posted and updated as you implement. I think a lot of folks on the on the webinar will be really interested in hearing. Um, so we're actually going to transition now. I know we um, folks have been raising a lot of great questions on the chat, and we're going to transition um, over to today, Gabriel Asali, about um, doing uh, re responding to some of the questions that you all have raised. Hi, can, can everybody hear me? Great. Um, so there were a couple questions, um, and it also came up during the discussion around proof. So maybe if we can dig into this just a little bit more, and maybe I'll start with um, Jim. There was a question, hoping to hear a little bit more about what workers might need to actually prove retaliation. What are some options that could be used as proof? So from the agency perspective, um, I mean, apart from the slam dunk. Yeah, I mean. Um Obviously, recordings are 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 always helpful. Um, um, you know, you know, any kind of recruit. You know, yes, the slam dunk is a slam dunk. We get at the proof by sort of taking um, the 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 statement from from the workers uh, and um, uh, and and giving the employer a chance to respond. But you know, working as fast as we can to pick it apart. It's people in a situation are not usually thinking about the proof or anything like that. They're sort of in the moment. They're they're living it. So I think just um, a prompt and timely outcry to either the Department of Labor or an advocacy group or somebody um, that's extremely helpful. And and to that end, I think where we could do better um, is really um, in the support. 
uh, for people who do come forward. Um, so if you're certified as a victim of labor trafficking, let's say in New York State, there's, there's, there's a, a bunch of services that provide support um, with that designation. And if something similar were, were to be brought to bear in the retaliation context, I'm not exactly sure what that would look like, that would go a really long way to having a little bit of breathing room um, uh, to deal with it. So I don't have a real sense of like what to do about the evidence other than to say um, the, the, the promptest outcry you can make either to a community-based organization or a faith-based organization or the Department of Labor or a legal services organization, faster the better. That's the only thing I would say on that. Does anybody else want to weigh in? Before we move on? Just on, um, on problems of proof, I mean, I think that we have told our clients or workers in a campaign that when you are disciplined, try to ask questions right away. Try to, you know, ask the employer, why is this discipline happening, getting details um, so that we can actually, um, you know, sometimes the initial, that employer's not prepared for that and the initial reason that they give is something that we can prove is more contextual or that the reasons are changing over time, the rationale that are that is given for the, the adverse action changes over time. I think um, more and more workers have smartphones or phones with cameras or that can record things. Here in California, we've run into the issue of wiretapping and kind of um, whether the recording is, um, you know, authorized or, or known or whether it's a um, secret recording um, but we have been trying to think more about um, giving the employer um, notice at the beginning of a campaign that any future conversations with workers um, uh, about the workplace are not to be considered private and, and, and you, you can't assume that they are going to be private conversations and then try to carve out some um, ways around the wiretapping the concern um, by by putting them on notice about that and then being able to use those recordings then in retaliation cases. Um, and then I think people have mentioned this before, but leg legislative kind of efforts to change the proof that's required and to create presumptions in the law that if the adverse action happens within a certain amount of time of the protected activity, that there should be a presumption that it's retaliatory. Great. And actually, that, that was another question somebody had in a city that's thinking about pursuing a rebuttable presumption like that. Um, was there a lot of opposition? Is there a lot of opposition to that standard? Um, and has it actually been proven useful in your cases? Is it worth pursuing? I, I can't say as much about the um, effort behind, behind some of those legislative um, fixes or those legislative campaigns, um, but they're definitely useful. We've definitely cited them and referred to them and referenced them. I think they're definitely worth fighting for. Great. And here's a question for any of the advocates related to um, immigration threats. Has anybody recently tried to invoke the, memoran the memorandum of understanding around ICE threats? Um, the sense is that advocates aren't trying to do it given the lack of trust with ICE, but curious to hear if anybody has had experience on this recently. Um, I can say from our perspective or from our, our practice, we haven't um, tried to invoke it recently, but we still trigger it. We still think to trigger it. Um, we did have a conversation um, in San Francisco short, you know, after um, this administration um, went, into, went into office, um, where career folks from those three agencies came and spoke advocates here. And, you know, this was a while ago, they, they you know, stood by them that we should continue to push um, around those MOU. Um, under notice. So that was some time ago. Um, I don't, I haven't heard of folks trying to 
use them here um, to cite them or needing to cite them or, or not needing to cite them, but citing them um, and being told that they don't apply anymore. So we still, um, when a worker is threatened, um, still think to file a claim with DOL just to trigger the MOU. So sometimes we have a claim pending with the labor commissioner's office and because we are concerned about immigration problems or threats being made, we will file a claim with the DOL and ask them just to hold it, that the claim is pending with the labor commissioner's office, but we want to also cross file with DOL just so we can argue that the MOU is triggered in case we need it and have it as a possible option. But we, we haven't actually cited it since then. Great. Um, this is a question specifically around, um, I guess, specifically directed to um, Veronica and Sarah around the construction. Have there been any efforts to kind of focus on the construction industry specifically um, and punishing bad actors in the industry? Um, Um, we definitely are, are trying to focus more and do more Know Your Rights trainings and produce more materials for construction workers, not specifically around retaliation, but generally. And I'd say in, in part because, well, construction workers make up the single largest group of our clients, but also it's, it's probably the industry where our workers have the least evidence. And we've recently put out a, a guide that includes information on workers' rights, but also has space for workers to record their work hours, their pay, information about the employer. Um, and, and we're hoping that workers who are armed with that guide and who have come to a, a Know Your Rights session at our office are, are better armed to prevent against the violations in the first place. Um, Westchester recently passed a law that gives the county the authority to revoke uh, um, the license of a home improvement contractor on a final determination of wage theft. And just listening to the panelists talk today, I'm wondering if we could push the Department of Consumer Protection, which enforces that law, to also consider when threats made to workers should put the home improvement contractor's license in jeopardy. And to, and to also talk with our, our members and to arm them to start documenting cases where the employers are making threats. We, we still have the problem that this is only a, a, a useful tool for contractors who are licensed and a lot of the employers who are robbing our members are also uh, not complying with the licensing laws, which is another issue. Great. Well, thanks so much, Sarah. And thank you, Sade, for facilitating. And um, really, thank you to all of our speakers today. I know it's, it's almost 4.15, um, but I think that this has been a really helpful conversation, at least for me, um, in thinking through what we're seeing and kind of brainstorming maybe some new areas to explore.